Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day to be gathered this morning to uh, worship here, and if you're at your home, worship with your family. It's indeed a great and immense privilege for us to, uh, to worship our Creator, our God, our merciful, loving Father in heaven. So uh, before we proceed with uh, our worship, uh, we have a couple of announcements here. Um, first of all, the care and precautions. Uh, let's continue and maintain that uh, safety measures. And as we leave the church, uh, we begin from the very back and proceed outside. Now, there's a, there's a men's uh, study coming very, very soon. And tonight, uh, if you are, and you should be, joining this uh, study, please contact uh, Eric, uh, Craig, or Andy tonight so that they can plan on who are coming and also if they're ordering books. I think Craig has offered to uh, order the books for you, uh, whether it's digital format or hard copy. Is going to do that. So, uh, and I think I believe the uh, study will commence by this weekend. I think it is this weekend. So there's three studies. Uh, number one is "Enjoy Your Prayer Life" by Michael Reeves, and Eric has volunteered to uh, to do this for us. Uh, second one is "Willing to Believe: Understanding the Role of the Human Will in Salvation." by R.C. Sproul. And uh, Craig is the one going to lead us on that. And the third book uh, study is Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Uh, please contact Andy Johnson if you are planning to join that uh, group. So again, um, let us do this tonight if possible. And we will begin that study very soon. Um, anything else, Pastor Tommy? Anybody? Greg? Okay, I'll uh, sit down. And... If you open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, we'll be reading the first nine verses. The heading is Compassion of the Lord. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live 
and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word this morning. Let's pray. O oh, great and awesome God. God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning knowing that you are the searcher of hearts. We ask you this morning to search our hearts and to find if there's any evil way in us, Father. And through your word, by the power of your spirit this morning, set us and make us steadfast in the way. Oh, Lord, bless us this morning with your presence. May we leave this place this morning, having heard from you through your servant this morning, minister to us this morning, we pray, that we may give you glory by worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And we ask it for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Let us all rise, please. Um, I'm going to sing, come Christians, join to sing. It's uh, on page five of your worship guide. I was uh, looking at uh, scriptures, um, and it, this keeps coming back to me, uh, John chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. And Jesus said to her, this is uh, during... Jesus' conversation with this Samaritan woman by the well. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So let us come to Christ. Uh, the author of our salvation, that we can freely and immensely privileged to, to worship him today. So let us sing, come, Christians, join to sing.
please turn over to uh, page six of your guide. And we will sing, We come, O Christ, to you. We come, O Christ, to you. Because he is the way to God. He is the living truth. He is the only true life. And, you know, it was in the second verse, in you we face our judge and maker unafraid before the throne absolved which we stand. Your love has met your lost demand. If not for Christ, we cannot approach the Father. So what a wonderful privilege for us to be able to have the confidence to approach the Lord and sing even, we come, O Christ, to you. morning. We're going to continue our worship service with a second scripture reading. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. And we'll be reading 4 through 21, if you'll follow along. Luke 12, verses 4 through 21. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, 
the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And every one who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and then I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning singing your praise, singing our hope and salvation in your Son, hearing your word read, following along with it, meditating upon it in our hearts. And Father, we know, looking at this, that, that like that rich ruler, like the person who hears Isaiah's call and turns away, that, that we are prone to sin, that we're lost and dead in our sin apart from your grace and your mercy towards us. And we thank you, Father, for the work that you've done in the hearts of the people that are here to stir us up, to see you and your beauty, to see the truth of your law and your word, to know our need as sinners and our inability to save ourselves, Father, and to trust upon the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, on behalf of sinners. And the work of your spirit, Father, in applying that to our hearts and in sanctifying us to become more like him each day. And Father, our hope is not in this world and our possessions here. Our hope is in eternity with you, glorifying you, knowing, Father, that you care for your people, that you've made promises that are more solid than anything on this earth. Be with us now as we worship you. Be with us as we hear your word. Help us, Father, to hear it and to understand it, to draw closer to you. If there are any here, Father, who do not know you, we pray your spirit would stir their hearts up, make them alive, help them hear, help them give you glory and praise. Be with us now, Father. We ask these things in your Son's name. Amen. Please rise once more, and uh, we're going to sing How Firm a Foundation uh, from your hymn, I mean, from your bulletin is page seven. As uh, Craig prayed, uh, Christ be our foundation. That he be the stable source of our hope. Um, reminded of the song, Steady Anchor, the Lord Jesus, our steady anchor. So let us sing this hymn, How Firm a Foundation. Can he say? 
if you would, um, turn over to page eight, and uh, I'm going to sing this um, song by faith. It is by faith that we see the hand of God. Um, and Pastor Tommy will give this message to us this morning and with heart, uh, expectant heart to receive the word of God preached to us. This is the same faith that the fathers before, when they roamed the earth, like Abraham doesn't know where he's going, but he just trusted the Lord and remained faithful, and the Lord blessed him. So let us sing this faith, uh, this song by faith. Well, as you're turning to Daniel chapter 5, uh, 
I just mentioned in your uh, worship guide there on article on pages 10 and 11 pertinent for today. I think uh, where do your convictions come from? A really good article <clears throat> about how it is that we establish what we think and uh, what we believe and what we're going to live by. In a world full of opinions and truths. Let's begin just by reading. I'll read part of five. And then we'll begin our trek through this passage. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tested the wine, commended, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temples in Jerusalem be brought, that the kings and his lords, wives, and concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote, then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king, king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. So uh, then verse 10 and following through, the queen comes in, the queen mother comes in and uh, tells uh, Belshazzar, there is a man in the kingdom, his name's Daniel, he can uh, help you in your uh, understanding and the interpretation. So they bring Daniel in and Daniel comes, he recounts the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, that we looked at there in chapter 4. And so I'm going to pick up in verse 21 again as Daniel is closing his story to Belshazzar about Nebuchadnezzar, verse 21. And he is Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. All this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter, Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. 
Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help. I thought also with verse 4 of by faith, the church is called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost and deliver the captives and preach good news. Uh, We might think about those who are serving around the world uh, in nations less fortunate than ours. Though we are in turmoil, we uh, still uh, live in a very, very comfortable situation but we need to pray that the gospel go forth in our nation just as well so let's ask the lord's help for today and be concerned for those who are have gone out by the call of god our father we have heard the call each one of us who've come to faith in christ And though you've not sent us overseas as you have our friends in the Middle East or the Housleys in New Guinea or the Risleys in Spain, Father, the Bass family teaching in Amsterdam, those that you have sent away from their homes, answering the call, knowing that their home is truly in heaven and not here on this earth. Lord, we pray that you would help us here to live by faith and to know that our sending out may not be to the nations far away, but to the neighborhoods in which we live, to the communities that we uh, spend our everyday life in to one another here in our church and in churches around our land. Uh, We pray for faithfulness and faithful living. Father, we pray for a right uh, right understanding, a recognition of the world around us. Lord, we're confused at times. We are angered at times at what we see and what we hear. People living uh, differently than we think they ought to. We ourselves living differently than others think we ought to. And so, Lord, we pray that Uh, you would give us understanding. Teach us about these things, even from this story. In the life of the nation of Babylon so many years ago, teach us that you are the one who puts down, who raises up, the one who grants prosperity and the one who brings calamity. You are the one who uh, works your purpose through every event and every circumstance of life for every creature that you have created. I pray this morning that we would bow our knee to you our sovereign God, and to the Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we have uh, jumped a number of years between chapter 4 and chapter 5. In fact, between verse 37 of chapter 4 and verse 1 of uh, chapter 5. A little over 20 years have gone by. 
Belshazzar is now king. Nebuchadnezzar just is gone. We have no explanation of what happened. We know from history that Nebuchadnezzar had died in 562 B.C. after serving for 40-some years. Uh, His son, Evil Merodach, followed, and within a year he is assassinated by his brother-in-law, Neri Glasser, who ends up being king of Babylon for four years. He dies, his son... Uh, Labashi Marduk is, as one of the commentary, liquidated within a month of becoming king and uh, through a conspiracy, and Nabonidus becomes the king. This is, uh, we're in 555, seven years after Nebuchadnezzar's died. Uh, ne- Nabonidus didn't really want to be king. He's just kind of appointed king by this group who, is, uh, who conspired against the last king. He's made king. The problem with Nabonidus, he has a different faith. He's got a different god that he likes. He likes the moon god Sin. And so essentially what happens is he is uh, most likely to avoid a lost confrontation with the religious leaders in Babylon, he takes off and goes 500 miles south to near Edom out in the Arabian desert and sets up his palace in an oasis out there, uh, which leaves his son, Belshazzar, to uh, serve as king in Babylon. Belshazzar is able to kind of fight off the uh, Babylonian clergy because he is more in tune to their supreme god Marduk, who's been their god for so long. And one of the clues that we get this, so Belshazzar is reigning in Babylon, but his dad's really king, Nabonidus, over in wherever he is there in south of Edom. One of the clues that we get this is... when he offers the kingdom to that, those who can, anybody who can interpret this handwriting on the wall, he doesn't give them the second place in the kingdom. He gives them the third place in the kingdom because dad, he can't give them dad's spot and he can't give them his spot. So all he can offer, the best he can offer is the third spot. So that kind of brings a little bit of confirmation into this scenario that we have from history because history doesn't record Secular history doesn't record Belshazzar as king. So that seems to be what has happened. And it, like I say, it's a kind of a, a, a giant step forward in time from the, death of, from the last scene in chapter 4 where Nebuchadnezzar makes a profession of faith, it seems, all the way to, in chapter 5, the death of the... Uh, empire of Babylon and the rising up of the empire of the Medes and the Persians. We know uh, this time gap. The book of Daniel is not a history book. It's not a secular history uh, meant to give us the details of the kingdom of Babylon. You You can find some of that in other history books, but it's concerned with the spiritual conflict um, between uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of man. And that's the depiction, and that's the purpose of the book of Daniel. And that conflict comes to the surface, comes rise, gives rise in history to these recorded events throughout the Bible. And so these events that we have in Daniel are meant to show us how it is that God is sovereign over everything, over history, over nations, over people. And that's why we don't have a detailed history of of Babylon that way. It's not a secular history. It's a theological history. And as we've been doing, I'll go back to chapter 1, verse 1 where it all began in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So verse 1 gives us a history. Here's a secular history. King Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem uh, and besieges it. Then verse 2 
And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God. There's the theological history. The Lord is at work. We, we see the events happen, but underneath those events is the hand of God working his purposes out. So we're back in chapter 5. This is an, a, an event recorded by the author, apparently Daniel pointing out this ongoing conflict between the kingdom of God and the world, recording these events that have to do with building the faith of the people of God uh, to teach us about our God, about ourselves. We see that we're really little different. There's a little difference between you and me and kings of foreign countries 2,500 years ago Man is man, sin is sin, and the Lord God never changes. Uh, so we're, uh, uh, we go from the, toward the end of ne- uh, Nebuchadnezzar's life, and we're dumped right into this. We're ushered right into this uh, feast uh, of Belshazzar in verse 1 of chapter 5. He gives this feast for a thousand of his lords, and they drank wine, And he drank wine in the presence of them. Uh, So Belshazzar at the end, all of a sudden this will, Belshazzar comes on the scene. Then at the last two verses, all of a sudden he's gone. Uh, He's dead. Darius the Mede, a new kingdom uh, uh, rises up. And gone, gone is Babylon. I put in there fallen, fallen is Babylon, which is... uh, straight out of the book of Revelation. Uh, This is just a further illustration. This story in chapter 5 is an illustration of God and his ability to pull down and raise up. Uh, If uh, if we fail to see the purpose of Daniel, we can get all excited about the stories, in particular when we read about Daniel. Um, and his three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who again are long gone out of the story. But we can get all excited about the stories and then make our own new commitments to be courageous Christians. Uh, uh, trying to do that apart from the loving, from loving the life transforming God, the God of glory and grace, the God of peace. And that's the purpose to help us to see the glory of God and to love him as we uh, live by faith. Uh, One other, a couple other points before we go into the text. Uh, You'll notice Belshazzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is called the father of Belshazzar. Well, as we read through scripture, father can mean my dad, or father can mean my ancestry anywhere as far back as we want to go. And we, we, we just read that through the scripture, and it's, it's, a, it's simple to see that. In one place in particular, John chapter 8, verse 39, Jesus is discussing with the Jews. And, of course, they're always back and forth and yaya and, 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 and uh, questioning Jesus and his authority. And at this point, at a particular point in the conversation, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Well, Abraham lived 1,500 years before that, at least. And and so Abraham is our father, meaning he's our ancestor. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. So there's just that idea. Father can mean you know, my da- uh, your dad, my dad, uh, immediate, or it can just mean part of the ancestry of which we be- to which we belong. And that is how Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is at least grandfather, if not great-grandfather, to Belshazzar. Maybe the queen mother is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, who uh, would be Belshazzar's mother. That's possible. Uh, it's hard to know because we don't have a full-fledged history here in Daniel. You can go read Xenophon or Herodotus or somebody like that if you want. I didn't go that far. But he is his father. 
And then the, the, there's a contrast between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar in how we're told the story. Nebuchadnezzar, we have four chapters. We have a number of events. And, and, and what happens is, as, as the story is laid out in chapters 2, 3, and 4 in particular, it kind of plods along and plods along. And then late in the chapter, the, the story is relayed and, and the event, uh, the, the meaning of it, the interpretation of it comes out. Uh, not here. Uh, in verse uh, one, we're immediately plopped into the feast. Verse five, immediately the fingers of uh, the, the fingers of a human hand appear, and then at the end, on that very night, uh, Belshazzar is gone. The kingdom is gone, and a new kingdom rises. So it's instead of the patience of God in dealing with Nebuchadnezzar, we have kind of an immediacy where we meet Belshazzar, and that very day he is. He is history. Um, So God moves in mysterious ways. He gives Nebuchadnezzar years to repent. And Belshazzar, as it comes to him and the handwriting comes on the wall, as he experiences the presence of God, he's got a mere hours or minutes uh, to contemplate what's happening. And... uh, to know, know that God is gracious and yet not turned from sin in the light of that grace is to fall under his righteous judgment. And that's what happens in Belshazzar's case. He, uh, verse 20, I believe 21, you knew this. Maybe that's 22 there. I know where it is on my page. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. Belshazzar knew it. He just did not pay attention to it. So the handwriting on the wall, the first nine verses that we read uh, is the scene of the handwriting on the wall. The king has a party. He's showing out. He's not just everybody have a good time. He's drinking his wine in front of the thousand people that uh, that he had invited and one of the historians says that the only thing learned from history is that we've learned nothing from history. Belshazzar knows nothing about the history. He's not learned anything from it. He's totally or apparently essentially unteachable. Um, while they are in this revelry, having, while they are in this party... History tells us the Medes and the Persians are right outside the city walls, already working to overtake the city. Um, Nebuchadnezzar has built, had, had refortified the original wall. Then he built two more walls around the original wall. Uh, Kind of like we have 610, right? And then Beltway 8, and now we're building that whatever, that other Grand Parkway 99, whatever. We're securing the city. Well, it's not very secure. But Babylon was secure at least as far as uh, Belshazzar was concerned, as far as the people were concerned. They had stores of food. They could last for uh, years And so they felt secure, they felt proud, and so they enjoyed themselves. Um, We had Craig Craig read about the rich fool. It's kind of a, this is an Old Testament parallel to the rich fool who was blinded by his pursuit of money, of prosperity. Here, Belshazzar is blinded by his pursuit of pleasure, of, uh, uh, of just having a good time oblivious to the possibility, just as the rich fool that Craig read about, that this night, the possibility, this night your soul might be required of you. Uh, Belshazzar is just oblivious to that. Um, And his sin is that the nature of his sin, one, he's just, he's arrogant, he's showing off. You get a picture of the theatrical as he's, Uh, this great feast and he drinks wine in front of the thousands and as he tastes the wine 
as the inhibitions decrease, he has an idea. Let's bring out the vessels from the temple of Jerusalem, the gold and the silver. Um, he brings out those vessels and then drink their wine out of these vessels, toasting the gods of what is... Uh, they drank wine, verse 4, and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. It's a particular blasphemous act at this party. So his, his sin is truly blasphemy. He's kind of thumbing his nose. This, these vessels represent the presence and the power of God. They have been brought from Jerusalem to Babylon, locked up in the closet by Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar has brought them out, and now they're drinking wine and praising their gods, this is what we think of your God. Um, so the idol factory, you know, Calvin says our hearts are idol factories. They just manufacture idol after idol. Well, the idol factory within the heart of Belshazzar produces this rebellion against God. Ezra says there were 5,400 vessels from the temple stored in Babylon that they brought back. They, Cyrus gave them to Ezra and those who came back. 5,400 articles. I don't know how many they used in this party. But at least in the record, in our Bibles, Nebuchadnezzar had the sense and the decency to leave these things in the, in the closet. Uh, Belshazzar had no such sense. And then adding the insult to the injury, he toasted the gods who can't see or hear or know. Uh, so his sinful heart caused him to be spiritually blind and spiritually deaf. And what we can know is the heart of man being sinful Belshazzar and his lords and his wives and his concubines, they didn't start drinking, get drunk, get, get a little bit loose to the point to where they couldn't think straight and they just were doing stupid stuff. Well, you get a little bit loose drinking a bunch of wine, you will do stupid stuff. But his view, their view of life was wrong. And their thinking was twisted long before they opened the first bottle of wine at that party. They'd rejected God. Belshazzar knew about God and had rejected him. We could go to Romans 1 and walk straight through Romans 1 uh, that everyone knows who God is. So they have no excuse. But they're rich and secured in their palace, in this fortified palace behind the fortified walls. And he said to himself, just as a rich fool, you have ample goods laid up. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Never thinking like the Epicureans, tomorrow we die. <laughs> Never thinking one thing about dying. Just take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And then all of a sudden, the hand comes. The shadows of blindness are dispelled by this writing hand. Verse 5, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. Verse 6, and the king's, this is a great description of what happens. His color change, you know, all the blood drains out of his head. He gets his pale. His thoughts are alarmed him. Oh, the ESV has really sanitized. His limbs gave way. Uh, I forget exactly how New American says it, but the, if you have King James, the, uh, what is the, the joints of his loins are loosened. And it's just, you just, yes, so. And then his knees knocked together. So the blindness is dispelled by this writing hand. The deafness is uh, uh, 
uh, removed by the voice of the prophet, warning him that his soul would be required that night. He saw the writing, but apparently didn't understand, or at least the full implication of it. But even in his foolishness, even in his foolish and probably drunken state, he, he realized this was an ominous writing. This was something bad was going on. His life is shaken. It's shaken to the core. Uh, and that presence of God uh, brings this physical change an emotional change, and it settles in, and it's not very pretty. And those who are watching at the party are probably not very inspired by this picture of their king. Uh, quivering bowl of jelly is what I wrote down in my notes. Uh, one minute he's the king of glory, the next minute here he is, can't even stand up. And so the question might be, as we're at this place so far, this is kind of where Nebuchadnezzar was before the Lord brought him to his senses. So is Belshazzar about to be converted? Well, we, we know the story. Uh, Edwards would say, it's always a mistake to imagine emotional response accompanied by physical manifestations, manifestations to necessarily mean conversion. He says Scripture never anywhere gives us any such, you know, we've seen, you've probably seen crying and uh, tears and uh, broken and words said and yet a life not changed, sort of like Nebuchadnezzar for two chapters before the third chapter. Um, uh, the, uh, will God give Belshazzar now 12 months like he gave Nebuchadnezzar after warning, him, warning Nebuchadnezzar for a second time? Remember he, the statue, and you're the head of gold, and that head's going to roll, so your kingdom's going to be gone, he told him in chapter 2. Then in chapter 4, he told him, here's the decree of the watchers. You're going to go out in the field. And 12 months later, after being told that judgment was coming and it was decreed and it's going to come for sure, Nebuchadnezzar's walking around his patio saying, look what I built. <laughs> Still acting like he's uh, the ruler of everything. And so God brings him low. Was well, God going to give Belshazzar in his arrogance here uh, this long period of time to uh, turn uh, away from his sin and turn to God. Well, again, we know the story, so it's a reminder we don't dare presume upon the grace God has shown to others. Uh, and Belshazzar makes a foolhardy response. Look at verse 7. What does he do? The king called loudly to bring in who? the enchanters, Chaldeans, and the astrologers. Um, he calls for, uh, we could put all kinds of adjectives here, inept, ignorant, uh, uh, wise men, or, uh, or let's turn it to buffoons, or unwise men, masquerading as wise men, not once on record. Have they helped the king? Nebuchadnezzar calls them in at least twice. Belshazzar calls the same group of people. It's probably a different set of them, but the result is the same. What, what is it? Uh, I don't remember who it was. It's attributed to no telling who, whether or not the attribution is right or not. You know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Well, here's the insanity of... Belshazzar calling in these same guys and uh, it tells them you read this and interpret it for me and you get a prize new clothes a gold chain and third position in the kingdom and surprise surprise they can't interpret it and they just kind of stand by the side and then uh, then uh, verse 9 
Then Belshazzar is no longer alarmed. He's greatly alarmed. And he becomes even paler. And even his guests are perplexed. This is not good. Everyone is now uh, troubled at what is going on. Uh, it, it made me think uh, the, the word is paroxysm. We don't use that in our normal language, so I had to go to a definition because I remember Paul having a paroxysm as he walked through Athens all by himself, and he saw the idols everywhere, and his spirit was provoked in him. Well, the definition of a paroxysm is sudden worsening of symptoms. Well, it's definitely a paroxysm here. When he calls in his wise men, they cannot help him whatsoever. So what's he going to do? Belshazzar uh, has an a, a, a increase, a worsening of symptoms. So in his own spiritual bankruptcy, he turns to the bankrupt wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world that 25 years ago had no answers and still has no answers today. Um, in, a book, in a magazine, I used to read a magazine, uh, <laughs> Newsweek, you may have read it. It used to be in print. Uh, and it had a page early on that was sort of a summary of, of what's going on that week called Conventional Wisdom. And so you would see, and it'd have an arrow going up or an arrow going down, and a statement of conventional wisdom, what's the wisdom of the day, and then a, a little short blurb about it, and then up or down. And the reason that you can't have a conventional wisdom uh, page today is there's no conventional wisdom. <laughs> Everybody has their own idea. I mean, you know, it's a, we, I can think what I want to think, and it's true just as much as yours is true, and there's no such thing as conventional wisdom anymore. But there's no wisdom from the world that's going to help anybody in the long run. And, but man and woman and boys and girl turn to the same um, wisdom of fools again and again and again. Uh, when faced with their own frailty, when the handwriting is on the wall and all the blood drains out and panic sets in, where are you going to go? Last week, I looked to heaven. Nebuchadnezzar lifted his eyes to heaven and found the answer when he couldn't find the answer before. People reach to the same old thing. Cupboards bare. There's nothing. The word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolish. I'll just read a couple of verses as Paul enters into Corinthians. Uh, a proud city. Corinthians, a bustling seaport. Busy, busy, busy with commerce. Paul opens his letter in chapter 1. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The word of the cross, the gospel of grace, is foolishness to those who are perishing. And the natural response of man unaided by the Spirit, will look at you and say, that just doesn't make sense. Foolishness. Silliness. Because it bristles their pride. It it's goads them when God says you have to, you can do nothing to contribute 
you have to cry out for mercy and seek deliverance from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that just offends our natural arrogance, our egos, to tell us we can't fix ourselves. I mean, after all, we, we have this, we have our lives together. We can do it. That's why Hebrews 11, uh, we sang by faith a, a kind of a summary of, he, of Hebrews chapter 11. All who come to him must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's the message of the cross and its foolishness to the world and to those of us who are being saved. It is the power of God. Well, uh, then we get to verse 10. And I um, forget which one of the common, even kings of the world have to listen to their mom, you know. Um, the queen, verse 10, because of the words of the king and his lords, I don't know if you notice, he, 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 he hollers out loudly for these wise men to come in, and the lords are perplexed, and so the queen hears all the hubbub in the palace going. She had the sense not to be at this party, apparently. And since his wives are there in the party, it must be, I, I just take it to be the queen mother, at least maybe Nabonidus, his dad's wa a wife who stayed in the palace while he ran off to Edom. Uh, but the queen comes in. Um, and because of the words of the kings and the lords, it's, well, it's all the hubbub was all the ruckus um, what we see from this discussion she comes in with is that Belshazzar may have forgotten about Daniel but the queen mother has not um, she enters tells him don't be alarmed uh, there in verse 10 O king live forever let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change, and you can imagine that conversation going on. Well, Mom, you're a little late to the party. It's too late. It's already changed, and I, my thoughts are alarmed. But she says, verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom who can help you. And so she tells him about who Daniel is. There is a man in your kingdom, verse 11, in whom there is the spirit of the holy gods in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him a chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel and she says, call him in. He will help you. Um, so, there is a man. If we were to read Isaiah chapter 11, the first, I think, five verses or so, the same language in a prophecy of the Messiah would, is used as Daniel is described. So there's that sense in which Daniel is described in messianic terms. Uh, not saying anything about Daniel, uh, except that uh, 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 she says the spirit of the gods are in him or on him, and that would be sort of the pagan way of describing supernatural work of God in the life of someone. Uh, the spirit of God rested on Daniel. She recognized he had a spirit of wisdom and understanding uh, and you have this, the Old Testament kind of pushing us forward all the time to Christ. One of the Puritans says the Old Testament is the swaddling clothes for Christ. It's kind of the a precursor, of course. There's a man. There's a man in the kingdom. Uh, Rusty sided the woman at the well. Well, in that story of the woman at the well, after she has the conversation with Jesus, she goes back into town to her uh, neighbor's Come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? Uh, uh, she's been going to that same well over and over, day after day after day, not finding any answers. You remember the story. Four husbands. 
uh, living with the fifth, looking for satisfaction and going in the same places and never finding it. You know, she's, she's in a conversation with you. When the Messiah comes, he'll sort all this stuff out. And Jesus lovingly gets, tells her, I'm the, the one who speaks to you. I'm, I'm him, he. And so she immediately becomes evangelist. She goes back into the Samaritan village. There is a man to whom you may go if you're not a Christian. A man who's come down from heaven with wisdom and might and forgiveness in his hand and peace that he offers. Hope, contentment. But there's only one man who can offer that, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, ho, everyone who is thirsty, that's what Bruce read, come to the waters that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. The answer for the longings of our heart. So, the queen sets Daniel forward as, a, if you will, a shadow with her language, the shadow of the one whom all the ultimate questions are answered. And so Daniel comes in in verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I almost feel like there ought to be a question mark there. That Daniel? Um, Uh, it's been almost 60 years. uh, No, it's been almost 70 years since Daniel has been brought to Babylon. He's in his 80s by now. You've been an exile here. You've you've been our captive. I mean, just kind of treating or asking, uh, you're going to help a slave from Judah? He says, I've heard of you. I heard all this about you. I I would say that he heard about it from his queen mother, except when we get down later, it says, you knew all this already, Belshazzar, as Daniel is uh, talking to him, talking to him. But he's still stuck on himself uh, as, uh, you know, just again, much like Nebuchadnezzar before he is broken, but he reveals his hard-heartedness as, uh, you know, his loins have just been disjointed and he's, he's been shaken up and in panic and yet he's still arrogant, which is a picture of the lostness of man, isn't it? Uh, the, but he treats this one who has the answers with contempt. You're just a slave. You're just one of the exiles of Judah. Uh, But apparently, I hear you have a gift, so let's try it. You have an ability, verse 16 says, to solve problems, uh, interpret dreams. And and again, the contrast, um, verse 15, the wise men and enchanters have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not. And then verse 16, but I have heard that you can. They cannot, but you can. That same contrast was put together in episodes with Nebuchadnezzar. They couldn't. I've heard that you can. Uh, And if you can, and if you do, it means new clothes for you, and it means uh, a uh, necklace, and you can have that third position in the kingdom. And so Daniel, verse 17, finally answers. Uh, Daniel says, keep your stuff. Let your gifts be for yourself. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Uh, There's a sense in which you can almost hear him say, I don't know what you mean by that, Daniel, but yes, I'm Daniel from Judah who's been brought here. I'm an exile. Yes, I'll read the writing. I'll tell you what it means. But first, first, we're going to talk a little bit about your family history, Belshazzar. And so he recites a summary of Daniel chapter 4, the happenings with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. See, Belshazzar hadn't learned from history. Maybe a reminder will help. 
Um, we're thrust immediately into this party, and immediately the hand of uh, God comes and writes on the wall, and going, we're going, and the story's going about so fast, and then all of a sudden, he's going to slow it down. He's going to slow the story down a bit to, to rehearse this history, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's story. He could have gone straight to the wall and interpreted the writing. But here's, here's a thought for us to ponder, too. Um, Belshazzar wanted the mystery solved. But God, using Daniel wants to help Belshazzar see why he's in the condition he's in. We just want a solution. I just want to drive through the line and get my hamburger. I don't care about how you make it, just give me my hamburger. And I want it, and I don't want to have to wait in line very long. Well, Belshazzar wants a solution, and God wants, God knows that he needs to know what put him in his predicament before the solution is given to him. Yeah, and as it goes through the story, everything he says, t- as he tells the story, everything Nebuchadnezzar had, he ruled the world, God gave to him. And uh, really it's the same thing that Jesus taught us. Uh, uh, you would have no authority unless it had been given to you from another, as he talks to the religious leaders. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had no authority except that God gave it to him. But in his arrogance, verse 20, he, he, he uh, lifted up himself. Uh, his pride and arrogance were brought down by God, and he lost his mind, and he lived with the animals. Verse 21 until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. So he was put out in the pasture, eating with the beasts of the field, until he realized and learned that the Most High God rules all. And then verse 22 and 23, it's driven home how personal this story is going to be for Belshazzar. Notice the word you or your as I read these two. And I think it's 14 times I would count them, but it just kind of takes away from. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose all your ways you have not honored. This is all about you. This, what's happened today with his handwriting on the wall is very personal to you, uh, Belshazzar. You can't plead ignorance. You knew all of this. You lifted yourself up against the God of heaven. You drank his vessels. You treated the gods while toasting the gods. And, and, and this, this, but the God in whose hand is your breath, the very breath that Belshazzar had to sing or to proclaim the blasphemies against God, the very breath that it took to do that, God had given to him. Um, He denied honor to the God who gave him the very breath to utter his blasphemous praises. You've chosen to honor, though you knew all of this. Uh, It shows this. Having the right information doesn't guarantee the right response. Um, You know, good data doesn't necessarily bring about desired change. 
we can see that in our view of education. You know, it, uh, we think if we spend more money to educate people, they'll succeed. If they know the truth about drugs, they won't take drugs. If they know truth about the consequences of immorality, they won't be involved in immorality. If they knew the consequences of sin, then they'd be different. Uh, well, education doesn't necessarily transform lives. They, in many cases, they become smart sinners. Uh, you know, moody. You, you teach a criminal to... Uh, you, you educate a criminal and he'll no longer steal the nuts and bolts of the railroad. He'll steal the whole railroad. Um, Daniel's point is Belshazzar knew and it didn't matter at all. We can fall in the same trap here in the church. There's a sense in which uh, I thought I was in a church with very little doctrine, didn't understand the doctrines of the faith. I thought right doctrine would le lead to right living. Um, and then I found out right doctrine is not enough to change lives. Um, there'll be no right living with the right motives without right doctrine. It's essential. But we have to keep the priority and the place of the Word of God in its place, in its priority. But we have to be aware of the danger of knowing without doing. The danger, uh, we need to ask the Spirit of God to help us apply the Word of God to our lives um, and cause it to produce obedience and transform our lives. Without the Spirit, the Word does not have the power it has when the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, drives it into our heart, and then empowers us to be different. Right doctrine will lead to right living, but it doesn't guarantee right living I know many people who can, who can declare catechism answers or theological, deep theological answers, and their lives are a mess. There's a danger in knowing and not doing. Um, and Belshazzar is, you knew all this, and yet you blasphemed the God who you knew about. In some ways, we're not that much different than Belshazzar. Maybe Belshazzar was thinking he'd have 12, maybe he somehow knew that Nebuchadnezzar has tw had 12 months and he'd get 12 months just like Nebuchadnezzar, but, you know, you and I don't know if we'll even make it home for lunch today. We don't know for sure Nebuchadnezzar was converted. Seems like he was, but it seemed like he was before. Um, that's why the Bible always says today's the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Why? That's why it's so in fact immediately this hand came, and then that very night Belshazzar was dead. This night your soul to the rich fool. This Verse 24, then this sovereign Daniel is going on with his uh, story to uh, uh, Belshazzar. And then from his presence, from the presence of God, the one whose breath, who gives you the breath you have to dishonor him, then from, the present, from his presence the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed and it's many, many tekel, euphorsin or parson, God has numbered your days. The kingdom is brought to an end. You're weighed in the balances. You're found wanting. The kingdom is divided, given to the Medes and Persians. And verse 29, really a interesting verse. 
Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the ruler of the third kingdom. You say, well, that's no big deal. I mean, he said he would. Well, one, Daniel said he wouldn't take it, but he took it. Um, probably had no choice but to accept it because... Belshazzar had no choice but to give it because he was on public record. He had to save face. We've seen that. We saw that in Judges with this foolish oath. Herod Antipas, um, who makes a, a, a promise to the uh, girl, his, was his niece or somebody, uh, I'll give you whatever you want, just keep dancing or something to that effect. And she says, all right, I want John the Baptist's head. Herod's not so happy that he has to do that, but he has to do it to save face because he made a public oath. I think Belshazzar is in the same situation. You can imagine Belshazzar, that Daniel, the exile from Judah, who has just told me I'm condemned, many, many tackle you farson, and told me what that means. And now he's got to give him the third place in the kingdom and all these rewards. Surely, it was only under the pressure to keep his word and save face before this public gathering that he did it. And so Belshazzar learned Nebuchadnezzar, with Nebuchadnezzar that the Most High God rules, but he learned it the hard way. That very night, verse 30, I mean, look how abrupt the ending is. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean was killed, the king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. And again, uh, the historians record that while this party is going on, and in particular in the, as it went on into the night, um, the city was taken during this night festival. The Euphrates River ran under the walls to guarantee their water supply in the city. They diverted the river. And where it went under the walls, the water was very, very shallow, and the army was able to march under the walls, and they took the city that very night Belshazzar's done in, and uh, uh, Darius be, the Mede becomes the king, and the Persian Empire is now has now conquered Babylon. Babylon is no longer. While Be <laughs> Belshazzar was proclaiming he was in charge of everything, his demise was being plotted, and then it was carried out. While Nero. Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Belshazzar drank while uh, Babylon fell. And Darius, Darius received the kingdom. He learned the hard way, Belshazzar did, that God, the God most high rules. <clears throat> he is sovereign. Well, I turned 70 this past week. Uh, last week uh, made me ponder once again Psalm 90. Psalm 90 that says our years are three score and ten, our years are 70, and if by strength uh, 80. Well, my 70 are spent, uh, so I'm working on the strength that only God can provide from now on. But so that we don't, and this is verse 9 of Psalm 90, so we don't bring our years to an end like a sigh, like Belshazzar did. We need to pray for the Lord to teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May he do that for us. This morning and every morning, henceforth. Father, we thank you that you choose to show yourself to us. Lord, not just in the writings of learned men, 
though we have many. But in the stories of the lives of those you have preserved for us in your word. And so we learn about you and your relationship with people. How it is that your ways are higher than our ways. We cannot fathom the mysterious way in which you work out your purposes. But you show us all we need to know. That you are the governor of the universe. The rulers and senators, presidents and dictators, are all a part of your purpose. And you've given your people assurance that everything is working out, accomplished according to the counsel of your will. Father, help us to learn that. Help us to take these truths, these truths and doctrines of the faith that we declare we believe and we profess as Christians. Lord, help us to hide these things in our hearts that we might not sin against you and we might be light and salt. Salt in a world that is decaying. Salt that preserves. Salt that seasons life. Use us, we pray. Bless us, we plead. Forgiveness, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, okay, um, I like to present to you. We don't. We, this should be like the Astros game. We should have cardboard cutouts of Andrew and Sam here this morning. You know, and and we could. Uh, and I saw. I was watching part of the basketball game yesterday, and they got these little. I don't know what it is, and the and the clapping hands and funny faces and. Uh, but Sam and Andrew today become official members. Sam is becoming an official member of the dorm at Lubbock uh, this weekend at Texas Tech. And is Andrew already gone? Huh? So Andrew's on the road to Arkansas? Missouri. Missouri. Wherever the uh, College of the Ozarks. So we have two new members. Anybody want to stand up here for them? But we have two new members, Sam and Andrew, and they are off to college. So you can't have access to them, except by, of course, all the ways. Be sure you contact them as you go. Let's stand, and we will uh, be dismissed with the benediction that we have in the worship guide. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Go and abound for the glory of God.